Hey there, Math 237 students, Zach here. This week we learned about limits and continuity for multivariable functions. And this video is meant to be a quick recap of these topics. So I'm going to start back in the world of Calculus 1. There you precisely define the notion of a limit for a function y equals f of x using epsilons and deltas. Informally, this definition states that we should be able to get our outputs as close as we want to the limit l by bringing our inputs sufficiently close to the target x equals a. If we want our outputs to be no further than, say, epsilon units away from l, you can take any epsilon you want here, we should be able to achieve this by restricting our attention to inputs that are within some really, really tiny interval around x equals a, but not including x equals a itself. The function might be doing something totally different at x equals a, or it might not even be defined at this point. That's okay. The limit just cares about what's going on as we approach x equals a. Now in Calc 1, you probably saw how this definition can be used to prove some theoretical properties about limits, such as our usual limit laws, or the fact that the limit is unique when it exists, right? The function can't approach two different values as we get close to x equals a. But when evaluating limits in practice, you probably had a whole different set of tools that you used, such as L'Hopital's rule or the squeeze theorem. The same is going to be true in Math 237. We'll use what we know from Calc 1 to motivate our epsilon delta definition of a limit, and that will be useful theoretically, but we have a different set of techniques for evaluating limits in practice. Let's take a look on the next slide. Our definition of a limit in multivariable calculus extends very naturally from our definition of a limit in Calc 1. In spirit, this definition says that we should be able to bring our outputs as close as we want to the limit L by bringing our inputs sufficiently close to xy equals ab. To get our outputs to be within epsilon units away from L, and this has to work for any epsilon you give me, we should be able to achieve this by restricting our inputs to, well, not a tiny interval around ab like before. Since we're working in a two-dimensional domain, we really want to restrict our inputs to a tiny disk or 2D neighborhood around AB. Of course, we don't include the point AB itself. The limit doesn't care about what the function is doing at AB. The function may not even be defined there. The limit just cares about what's happening as we approach AB. The similarities between our Calc 1 and Calc 3 limit definitions should be apparent when viewing these definitions side by side. The notable difference is that now we measure the distance between points in our domain not using an absolute value like before, but instead using the Euclidean norm. This is a byproduct of moving up to a 2D space. Our usual limit laws extend pretty nicely to the multivariable setting as well, and the definition of a limit can be used to prove them. In fact, if you're up for a little challenge in using this definition, try to prove that when a multivariable limit exists, it must be unique. The function cannot possibly approach two different values as xy gets close to ab. We have a couple different strategies for dealing with multivariate limits in practice. I'll first discuss our strategy for proving that a limit does not exist. Recall that the definition of a limit didn't mention anything about how our inputs approach ab. This means that if a limit exists, our function should approach the same value along every curve leading to ab. So what would it mean if we happen to find two curves leading to AB along which the function approaches different values? I guess it would mean that the limit is not unique and therefore our limit at AB must not exist. So to show that a limit doesn't exist, we can try to exhibit two different paths to AB where the function approaches different values. I've included a few of these situations below. In the first example, it appears that the function approaches a value of 1 as we move to the origin along the x-axis, but a value of 2 as we move to the origin along the y-axis. The limit at the origin, therefore, doesn't exist. In the second example, it looks like the function is approaching the same value along both of the coordinate axes, but different values along other lines to the origin. Again, the limit at the origin doesn't exist. Finally, there are some pretty wild functions out there that will approach the same value along every straight line to the origin, but still fail to have a limit there. This function, for example, approaches a value of 0 along the y-axis, but approaches a value of 0.5 along this parabolic arc. Crazy! Once you've found just two paths leading your outputs to different values, you can stop, 
and say with confidence that your limit doesn't exist. Proving that a limit exists is often a bit more challenging, but we do have a strategy that will work in certain situations. The first step is to find a candidate limit. That is, we must determine what the limit should be if it exists. The way we do this is by checking the limit of our function along certain paths to AB, just like we did in the previous case. If, for example, you find that the function approaches the same value L, some constant, along every single straight line to AB, this may be good evidence that the limit exists and is equal to L. Note, however, that this step is not sufficient to conclude that the limit exists. There are still infinitely many paths left to check. Parabolas, cubics, exponentials. You could never check all of them on a case-by-case -case basis. From here, you could keep checking other paths just in case you need more convincing, or you could try to prove formally that the limit exists and is equal to L. Our central tool for proving that a limit exists is the squeeze theorem. Essentially, we try to show that the difference between our outputs and this candidate limit L must tend to zero as we get close to AB. This is easier said than done, but the general strategy is to find an expression that's a little bit larger than this that obviously tends to zero. We have a few tricks for accomplishing this goal, and you'll see some of them in the example video to follow. All in all, proving that a limit exists is tough and takes a fair bit of practice. Don't get discouraged if your squeeze theorem estimates don't work out on your first attempt. The last topic we covered this week was continuity. Back in Calc 1, we saw that a function could fail to be continuous at a point for a few different reasons. For instance, maybe the limit as we approach this point doesn't exist. There's a clear break in the graph of the function. Alternatively, however, it could be the case that the limit does exist, but it just doesn't match up with the value of our function at this point. The function may jump up to a different value at this point, or it might not be defined here at all. In all of these cases, the function is discontinuous. If instead the limit exists at x equals a, the function is defined at x equals a, and these two values agree, the graph won't have any breaks. We'll say that f is continuous at this point. Our notion of continuity in Calc 3 is very similar. If our limit at a given point doesn't exist, we definitely wouldn't want to say that our function is continuous at this point. There's an obvious break in the graph. Even if the limit does exist, we would want it to match the value of the function at the limit point. So if our function jumps up at this point, or it isn't defined there at all, we wouldn't want to classify it as continuous. Our definition is very much analogous to what we knew in Calc 1. A function z equals f of xy is continuous at a, b, if it's defined at a, b, the limit exists at a, b, and these values coincide. Sometimes we write this simply as the limit as xy approaches a, b of f of xy equals f of a, b with the understanding that if we're saying that these two quantities are equal, they must both exist.